questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. Welcome to Q&A show. I'm excited about tonight because we have a guest by Skype all the way from Atlanta, Georgia in the USA, where he's pastor of a church of many thousands. He's a prolific author. He's also the leader of a TV ministry and significantly that ministry is starting on Revelation TV very soon. He was born in Egypt and grew up there. And so he's got a great deal to say about what's happening in the Middle East at this moment of time. So there's lots of things that we're going to be talking about. And because it's a Q&A show, we'd love to hear from you. If you've got some questions, if you've got some comments, then please do get in touch with us live at revelationtv.com. And of course, text us on 077 81 47 28 47. But before I introduce the guest, let me just remind you it's Thursday evening and that means that it's uh, phone night and over in our Revelation TV offices, some of our dear staff and some of our dear volunteers are waiting to receive your phone calls. If you'd like to stand with us and support us financially as a TV station, then Thursday night is your opportunity to ring up and to do that. And any time over these next two hours, they'd love to receive your phone call and to know that you're standing with us and support us in the work that we're going to be doing, that we are doing, I should say. So bless you and thank you in advance for that. Now, let me introduce to you Dr. Michael Yusuf. Dr. Michael Yusuf, it's so good to have you with us today on the program. Thank you so much for taking the time and talking to us. Pleasure, Gordon. So good to be with you, my brother. And I, my name is Michael, and uh, I so appreciate you inviting me tonight. This is a very special Thursday. It's Monday, Thursday, when we remember the Lord Jesus meeting with his men, and I'll be meeting with 600 of my men in a little while uh, for dinner to remember that moment when our Lord met with the man and told them that he is going to the cross mm. and he encouraged their hearts. Well, bless you. And, and Michael, we're delighted because starting this coming Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, your yes. program is going to be beginning on Revelation TV, 5.30 in the afternoon. And each Sunday from now on is going to be appearing, which is great. We're so delighted that you're going to Wonderful. be sharing with us. T tell us a little bit about your, your TV ministry. It, it, it's called uh, Leading the Way, isn't it? <laughs> Yes. Uh, you know, the, the one thing that, uh, you know, we've been on radio in the UK for many, many years, in fact, decades, but uh, 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 on some television stations, that's why we're glad to be on Revelation coming up this Sunday. Mm -hmm. And um, I got dragged into everything that I'm doing. And not because I, I wanted to be dragged. I just want to be sure that whatever I'm doing, that I'm doing according to the will of God and for His glory alone. And it's not something that is selfish ambition. Though I'm going to be 67 soon, I still want to be, to the last moment of my life, uh, obedient to the Lord, do exactly what He tells me to do, no more or no less. We started on radio about uh, 27 years ago. Uh, and God really blessed all over the world, 24 languages, uh, broadcasting uh, thousands of times each week in, in 195 countries. But then about 17 years ago, uh, a very well-known uh, minister, tele 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 television uh, pastor of a church right up the road here, decided to retire. He has a very successful ministry named Ben Hayden. Mm -hmm. And he called me and said, the Lord has spoken to me and told me to give you my television ministry. Wow. I said, I said for <laughs> years, I joked about having face for radio. But we went and prayed about it. My wife and I prayed about it. And uh, we accepted his generous offer. And we launched in 2001 here in the United States. And as a result of that simple obedience, now we have our own television station that is going 24-7 into the Arabic-speaking world, 166 million homes in the Arabic world, plus in partnership with Indonesian uh, Christian television, we are in 22 million homes in Indonesia. And so God took that simple obedience to say, okay, we'll take that step of faith. If that's from God, He will bless it. If it is not, it will fail. And as a result, uh, God truly has blessed and, and the television ministry has grown 
uh, in leaps and bounds, uh, now bigger than the radio ministry. Mm. M Michael, there are lots and lots of TV programmes produced. There are yes. lots and lots of TV stations as well. So yes. what is distinctive about what you're trying to do for your programme? Well, if you asked me that question 15 years ago, I may have had a different answer. But now I look back and I said, I know what the Lord was trying to do back then. I, I never realized that the day will come, and I never really even predicted that the day will come that those of us who stand on the authority of the Word of God, who believe that the Bible is God's self-revelation, that it is not that we do not stand in judgment on the Word of God, but the Word of God stands in judgment of us. And to uphold the biblical truth is going to be a rare thing. I never would have thought that. So to answer your question, Gordon, is I, I am now looking back and I said, Lord, thank you, because I have attacked a great deal because I am uncompromising. In fact, our motto is Amen. preaching uncompromising, uncompromising truth. Yeah. And so that is really the distinctive feature of leading the way, is that we are upholding the authority of the Word of God, the infallible Word of God, without compromise. Amen. Well, I, I'm excited. I wish I could be with you for your 600 meet it, men tonight who are going to be meeting with you for, for Monday, Thursday. But you, here you are in Atlanta, Georgia now. It sounds a lovely part of America to be in. But life it began, <laughs> okay, life began for you in, in a completely different part of the world, didn't it? Tell us right. about your, your, your beginnings. Sure. I was born in Egypt. Uh, my uh, ancestors were all Coptic as uh, you know, the Coptic Church yes. is a nearly 2,000-year-old church that was founded originally by the Jewish Alexandrians who were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and then heard the gospel for the first time from Peter. And as the book of Acts actually says, there were Jews from Alexandria. They went back to Alexandria, have taken the gospel with them, and they began to share the gospel in that capital city at the time, was Alexandria was the capital city, and the gospel began to spread, churches began to grow. Later on, the apostle Mark came uh, as, as a, an evangelist uh, uh, and, 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 and gave, buttressed that church and strengthened it. And as a result, by the early second century, all the way to the end of the third century, the church in Alexandria became the center and the hub of Christianity globally. Rome had not risen until the right. 300s. Yes. So yeah. the Church of Alexandria, and was a very faithful Orthodox church in the truest sense of the word, that is, uh, believing the word of God to be God's word and mm -hmm. God's self-revelation. And so that church has stood strong for all these years, even though when the Muslim Arabs invaded uh, the Middle East, they came from Arabia, invaded Egypt and North Africa, where the vast majority of people were Christians. The only reason the church in Egypt remained steadfast is because they refused to compromise the authority of the scripture. Right. Uh, the churches of North Africa said, oh yeah, God can speak uh, today with the uh, same authority as those who spoke, uh, written the scripture. And they got swept off their feet within a matter of a couple of decades, were wiped out completely by the Arab invaders. The reason there are 10 million Christians still in Egypt today is because the Church of Egypt remain steadfast to the authority of the Word of God. It is written, and the canon is closed. Nobody can add to it. And as a result of 1,400 years of persecution, they remain to this day very strong. Although I am a third-generation uh, Protestant or evangelical, but all my ancestors were basically Orthodox. Okay, I, I saw one of your quotes, which was, Islam grew when Christianity was weakened for its departure from biblical authority. And that's yes. really what you're saying, isn't it? But in the, in, in the countries where the church was weakened and it went, it diluted its biblical authority, then yes. Islam was able to grow. But where it stood strong, it, it exactly. wasn't able to do so. Exactly. I gave that as a speech, uh, uh, keynote address to our religious broadcasters convention here and that was uh, a summary of what you saw. But what I gave in the speech, I walked them through history, uh, chapter and verse, if you like, of whenever the church compromised its conviction, Islamists took advantage of that and they grew, whether it be 
even in Arabia itself, where heresies were, were abound during the rise of Islam, to North Africa, to today's Europe, as you know, and even in the United States. As the churches begin to compromise their conviction, Islamists take advantage of that and they grow. Okay, uh, so that says a lot to us today. Uh, and so I think we're going to be hearing on your broadcast a great deal about standing on the word. And when we stand on the right. word, then our defense comes against the overwhelming, at times, uh, enemy that seems to come against us. Amen. Okay, Amen. if I can take you back to your very beginnings, because sure. I think it's... Um, we read in, in the Old Testament that those words which says, before I knew you, you were formed. Uh, yes. and, and before you were born, I had plans for you. And your beginning was uh, amazing, really, because your mom was told to abort yes. you. And yes. pressure was put on her to do that, but God intervened. Tell us. I just uh, tweeted out on Facebook uh, and all the social media last month I said, 67 years ago this month, uh, my mother already had six children who were living, two uh, died at birth. Her health was in such a uh, weak state that three doctors told her that she has to abort, otherwise she may not make it through the pregnancy. Well, uh, they already agreed they were going to do it until their pastor, a godly man, I had the joy of knowing him the first 12 years of my life, and uh, he came and, in the middle of the night and he said, I am disturbed about this. I feel, as I hear from the Lord, that he or she is going to serve the Lord in some way. So my mother, being a godly woman, she said, I'll risk my life. That's fine. If this is a word from God, I trusted God. Mm -hmm. And she did. And uh, I came along uh, back in 1948. And then uh, what happened, God really spared her for 16 years so I had the joy of knowing her, of course, and seeing her as a prayer warrior who has actually taught me how to pray. Uh, so God is so gracious. Mm. So did, was, was faith for you something that you, you grew up with and, and grew into? Or was there a time when you realized you needed to make a, a specific commitment to the Lord? Uh, I grew into, but I rebelled. Mm -hmm. um, I got into my mid-teens, uh, uh, 15, 16, 17, and I really kind of rebelled against God. I, I, I did not like the idea of even going to the ministry. All my brothers are very successful bankers and, and business people, and I just did not like this, this idea of going into the ministry. So I thought if I run away, God cannot use me. <laughs> uh, but uh, how foolish that was because yeah. he dragged me he dragged me by the back of my neck, and I'm so grateful he did. And uh, so my faith even grew stronger uh, because I came to him out of rebellion. And in thanksgiving and gratitude, I said, I go anywhere, do anything. All you say the word, and I'm your servant. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you uh, made that commitment to me here, here today. Yeah. And of course, your journey out of Egypt took you via Australia to, to yes. the USA, where you're a minister today and pastor and writer yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and television broadcaster. Yes. After the Six-Day War I, uh, in the 67, I began to really realize that if I'm going to accomplish what I at least felt in my spirit that God is going to call me to accomplish, and having a global impact that I needed to get out. And it was tough back those days, in the days of Nasser. Egypt is a different country now. But uh, so I literally went uh, and left with uh, a very small uh, suitcase and uh, ended in Beirut, Lebanon for a few months. And then in 69, I went to Australia. And uh, in Sydney, I I had a great, uh, I, I went there as an immigrant, mm -hmm. I had a job, and I worked for a couple of years and uh, studied, and, and then I ended up uh, at Moore Theological College uh, in Sydney, and I graduated from there, and I was ordained in Sydney uh, in 1975. Okay, quite a journey. Well, I'm just looking already, folks are beginning to write in. Here's one text which has come in which says, it, it's super, I'm super excited to see Dr. Youssef on Revelation TV. My eight-year-old son, Michael, loves listening to Leading the Way. He listens on One Place app almost every bedtime. Looking forward to hearing more of the uncompromising truth on Revelation TV. Well, 
As How we... wonderful. God bless you, Michael. That's right. <laughs> OK, Michael, well, you and, and lots more people are going to have the joy of listening to Dr. Michael Youssef on Sunday evenings at 5.30 from this coming Sunday uh, onwards. And I'm sure you're going to be blessed and excited by it. Now, let, let's talk a little bit, if we can, about uh, a subject that is very much on your heart. Your, yeah. I, I don't know what the latest count is, but I, I certainly saw you've got 27 or 28 books. Maybe it's up to 38 or 40 books now. I don't know how many that you've, you've written, Michael. Yeah. Now, I've written 30 books altogether, and uh, the latest one is, uh, is Jesus, Jihad and Peace. Yep. Uh, but I have, uh, you know, I, I just discovered late in life, really, I was... Well, in my 30s, before I discovered that God really has given me the gift of writing, and I get such a great joy out of writing, and I write strictly uh, of, of areas and concept that is going to bless the body of Christ. That's really the, the desire of my heart. When I listen to many of our viewers who, who write and ring in to us, that there's, there's enormous fear about what is happening in the Middle East at this moment of time. Uh, sure. Our 24-hour news channels uh, show the pictures of Iraq, of Syria, of, of Lebanon, of, of all the situation that is, is coming there. Uh, what's your perception as you look at what's happening in the Middle East right now? Uh, I really, for the first time, uh, and, and this just by way of, of uh, explanation, um, uh, I went on the academic side back in the 80s and I earned a PhD from Emory University, a renowned university here in the States, and in social anthropology. And I specifically studied uh, Islamic extremism. I wanted to really understand, and I had opportunities to interview some of them. And I wanted them to know that as a, as a Christian believer, I love them as individuals, even though I don't agree with their ideology. And so, Everything I see that is happening today began to send me back into that academic study to find out what is really the eschatological thinking of Muslims. I'm aware of some of it, but I did not really understand. I began to compare it with some of the biblical uh, prophecies. Uh, and I found, and that's why I really wrote the whole book, Jesus, Jihad, and Peace, I'm a drawing uh, comparisons between the Antichrist, as described in the book of Revelation and Thessalonians and, uh, and elsewhere, and their concept of a coming Mahdi or guided one or Messiah uh, toward the end of time. Mm -hmm. And I began to draw those comparisons, uh, uh, not on an emotional or even theological level, on a factual, factual level. Uh, here's the facts. Here's what they believe. Here's what we believe. And I am now coming full circle, if you like, of believing that this is all leading into a, the prophetic uh, uh, predictions of the end times that we're living in. For years, I have not been an end time preacher, if you like. Uh, yeah. I preach the whole counsel of God. But I'm beginning to realize now at this uh, stage in my life that I think we are living through some very extraordinary days and could be, it could be those days that the book of Revelation has talked about. Well, already Satinder is writing in and saying greetings to us both. And she would like to ask Michael whether he believes that the Mahdi would be the coming Antichrist. Do you deal with that in the book? Yes, I do indeed. There's a whole chapter, actually, maybe several chapters, but uh, those details uh, delineate even the difference in the Mahdi's view in terms of the Shiites versus the Sunnis, they have slightly different uh, understanding. For the Shiite, for example, believe that he is the 12th Imam who disappeared in infancy, and he's going to come back when the world is in a state of chaos. Uh, but the Sunnis believe that he's, uh, Jesus is going to come and is going to assist the Mahdi, and he's going to turn on Jews and Christians, and he declares himself a Muslim. So all of these details I have in the book, Jesus, Jihad, and Peace, for that reason, because uh, you, you, you cannot uh, listen to, for example, the former president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, who talked a great deal about world chaos, uh, and then uh, listen to even the current 
uh, self-proclaimed caliph, uh, Baghdadi, and what he says about the end times and, and, uh, and the last days and so forth, uh, without understanding that this kind of eschatological views uh, on the part of some of the Muslims, not all the Muslims for sure, so on part that it's, it's very, it's very either, either the Antichrist or the false prophet. And those two, of course, very clearly explained in the book of Revelation, particularly uh, uh, chapter 13. Okay, well, we're getting into some deep stuff here, but in a sense, you can't look at the Middle East without get, getting into deep stuff. I was listening to a, a, a talk that you gave that, uh, on, on the YouTube, and, and you were talking about how out of, a Mus mother, out of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt has come yes. so much of the... Well, you said every time there's a breakaway, it seems to get more extreme and more extreme. Can you just begin to talk a little bit about that? Because Egypt obviously is your home and you're someone yeah. therefore who, who's got more factual knowledge about it than, sure. than many of us have, particularly in Europe. Sure. While I've been away for nearly 50 years, I still have a ministry and I have many friends, both Muslim friends and Christian friends, and I, I maintain these friendships in the Middle East, throughout the Middle East, not just uh, in, in Egypt and Lebanon and Jordan and Israel and so forth, I maintain those relationships uh, for very important reasons. I'm an evangelist. I want to win people to Christ. Uh, so, yes, uh, I think if you, and I did this, as I said, my PhD dissertation, mm -hmm. which is published, and it's in all university libraries. It's called Revolt Against Modernity. And again, this is a technical, academic, sociological book. And I show how with each successive movement that is birthed out of the previous one, it becomes more violent and more extreme. For example, the Wahhabi movement, which is started in Saudi Arabia and was extreme in itself, uh, it really gave uh, birth to and, uh, and inspiration to Hassan al-Banna, who founded the Muslim Brotherhood in the 1920s in Egypt. And while they were, had some violence within them, they really were more of a movement that wanted to rid Egypt of British colonialism and so forth. But then out of that uh, came another movement called Takfir wal Hijra, become more violent. Then out of that came Jihad, become more violent. And out of Jihad, they joined together with Osama bin Laden and came Al-Qaeda. That's become even more violent. And look, out of Al-Qaeda, we got ISIS or ISIL or IS, and uh, they are extreme in their violence. And the way they beheaded uh, these uh, folks in, in, uh, in Libya or in Iraq or in Syria, the way they crucified children, it, it's, it's uh, blood curdling, if you like. Uh, in, in, and, and so it's getting worse and worse and worse. Each successive movement becomes more extreme. It does indeed. Well, I'm talking to Dr. Michael Yusuf. If you've just tuned in, he's um, already begun to talk about some of the uh, things that have been happening previously in his life. But the exciting thing for us here at Revelation TV is that Dr. Michael Yusuf is going to be starting with us this coming Sunday evening, 5.30, and then each su succeeding Sunday evening after that. We'd love to hear from you. If you've got your questions, then please uh, do email us and text us in, and I'll be glad to put them to him on this special Q&A session. But I want to go now to a clip. This is where Dr. Yusuf is uh, being interviewed. Is it your son that you're, is talking to you? It's Joshua Yusuf. So it's Joshua, it? yes. OK, how many children do you have? Yeah. We have four children and almost eight grandchildren. Wow. So the family is, <laughs> is growing very much. And, and he's Bless. talking to you in this particular clip. Let's listen to it now. And uh, he's, he's asking his dad to try and explain and to help us all to understand what IS is all about. You know, we are seeing persecution yeah. on a scale we have never we've seen. never seen before. Right. And this is what you did your PhD in, this whole yeah. Islamic... I, yeah. I want you to help me understand who yeah. IS is. Well, I... IS is just another one of those movements. Uh, it, it began this Islamic extremism as it's known in the media. Uh, they call it true Islam. Not the one that's tainted with the West and the one that people are westernized Christians or, or reinterpreting the Quran to fit the modern day, which many are doing, which is great. But this is what they, what they call real Islam. It began 
with a movement in Saudi Arabia known as the Wahhabi movement. Uh, mm -hmm. Abdul Wahhab, who started this, he said, you know, the West is corrupting our religion. We need to go back to purity of Islam, meaning go back to 700 uh, AD mm -hmm. culture, not just religion, but culture. That is, absolutely go back to the dirt of the desert. Wow. And it caught slowly, but because of the colonialism and Western power being in the Arab world, it did not really uh, take hold uh, for a long time. Out of that came another movement in 1920 in Egypt known as the Muslim Brotherhood, founded by a schoolteacher by the name of Hassan al-Banna. And he founded that movement uh, uh, ostensibly to uh, defeat the British and uh, end colonialism, uh, but also to bring Wahhabism, which mm. a Saudi, uh, to this point, a Saudi movement, into Egypt and then the rest of the Arab world. He wanted to unite the Arab world under this Wahhabi flag. And since the Muslim Brotherhood, there are metamorphoses, they kind of... Uh, uh, every new group that comes out of the Muslim Brotherhood movement, it becomes more extreme. Uh, so you have, uh, uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, a guy named Said Qadb, who was more extreme than Hassan al-Banna. This is in the 50s, and then he was killed by Nasser. Uh, then it, from that came another movement called uh, Takfir wa Hijra. Uh, and they were basically have the same principles. Want to kill Christians, either convert them or kill them, Islamize the world, bring the caliphate, another word that gets bandied about, caliphate means successor to the prophet. Bring the, that original succession uh, to the prophet Muhammad. And from there came jihad. Uh, when Takfir wa Hijra got caught and put in prison, they and every movement that is born from the previous movement is more extreme. Mm. And from jihad came al-Qaeda, where actually the members of jihad in Egypt, many of them were killed after the killing Anwar Sadat. They joined together with Osama bin Laden and formed uh, al-Qaeda. But because of the secular leaders in the Arab world, it be Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, and they basically put the lid on them, so they escaped to Afghanistan. And I think from that point on, most people are familiar with the story, how they went to Afghanistan, how they plotted 9-11, and so forth. But this new group that is born out of Al-Qaeda says, ah, oh, Al-Qaeda, these are Sunday school kids. Wow. Uh, they're too tolerant. Wow. And even Al-Qaeda leaders are horrified by what <laughs> ISIS is doing. I mean, it goes to show you. And I think one of the questions we've been getting from people is, is this really real or exaggerated? I can tell you, it is not exaggerated. In fact, it is played down because of the gruesomeness of the things they're doing. Mm. Uh, things I can't talk about and stay in my emotional zone. Mm. It's, it's absolutely horrific, horrendous, uh, beyond any imagination. When, when our Secretary of Defense, Hegel, said, it's like nothing he's ever heard or seen in his lifetime. And you can understand this is, this is beyond the pale, what they're doing to Christians. And their aim is, of course, to control the Arab world. Of course, they're taking Iraq and Syria, and they would like to go to Lebanon and Jordan. And from there, they would love the prize, which is Saudi Arabia. Mm. And that's their prize. Mm. They would love to take that. And the problem is... Uh, it puts these leaders of Saudi Arabia and Jordan and so forth on the defensive. Are we going to fight and kill our fellow Muslims? What are we going to do? And it's, it, it, it becomes a dilemma for them. Welcome back to Q&A. Let me just remind you it's Thursday evening. Thursday evening is phone night. If uh, you'd like to ring the telephone number that you're seeing on the screen from time to time, then many of our staff and wives would love to talk to you and to receive your gifts. And thank you for standing with us. It's my privilege tonight on the Q&A to be talking to Dr. Michael Youssef. Michael, thank you so much for, for being with us all the way from uh, uh, Atlanta in, uh, in Georgia. I don't know, were you able to hear that as we played that clip of you talking yes, about sir. IS? Yes. Okay. Yes, That's good. I'm glad you could 
could listen to yourself and maybe learn <laughs> something from it. J just while you've been, uh, we've been listening to that, there's been some nice emails in from folks. Um, Joyce says, blessings in the name of Jesus. Dr. Yosef, welcome to Revelation TV. I'm looking forward to your words, standing on the truth. Have heard your services for many years. You do speak truth. And Joyce says, what do you know about the persecuted church? Thank you. And uh, Hannah writes in and says, Dr. Michael Yusuf, uh, you have, um, I am reading all your teaching and uh, uh, using uh, the guide to minister to others. God led me uh, to leading the way because of the uncompromising truth. Thank you. I never miss your teaching um, and uh, my journey on motorway, she listens to the radio particularly, um, was delayed many times when God gave me the Rima word through you. Amen and bless you. So Amen. folks are excited about you joining and we're excited about that too. But we can't be excited about what's happening in the Middle East. In fact, it's, it's horrendous. As, yeah. as someone who <clears throat> comes from Egypt, you're fully aware of the plight of the um, Egyptian church and indeed the yes. Middle East church and the persecution that is, is taking place there and the ethnic cleansing by the, the jihadists. Um, yes. Why are Christians so much the target of the jihadists at this time? Uh, I think there is this set, uh, concept within the Islamist thinking and they actually, when I interviewed these folks back in the early 80s, they never referred to Christians as Christians. I always talked about the Crusaders, the Zionists and the Crusaders. And they had this idea that if they do not try to destroy the West, the West is going to destroy them. That they have this, this fear that the West is going to crush them, that these Crusaders are going to come like they did back in the 11th century, and they're going to destroy them. Now, whether that's real or imaginary, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into this, but uh, the, this is their idea, this, we, better, we better kill them first before they kill us. Um, false, of course, because, you know, the, even the Crusaders were misguided people and, and, and whatever, I'm not going to get into that, but uh, they know deep down that the Christians are loving people, and they have come at a huge cost to themselves uh, as missionaries and brought the gospel to so many parts uh, of the Muslim world uh, without any expectations. Now, thank God for those who have come to discover the truth in Jesus, and certainly we do that unapologetically. We want to give them the best we have, and there can be no greater treasure than to know that one is eternally saved simply because God the Son came from heaven, died on a cross, and rose again. And we would welcome anyone to come and repent. And I always tell Christian congregations, I said, don't ever forget that the great Apostle Paul was also Saul of Tarsus, who was a terrorist, who was terrorizing the church. And so we must have great hopes that no matter how far they may go, the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God can reach them as long as we unite together in taking that gospel to them and to the ends of the earth. Lovingly, we, 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 our, our faith does not force anybody, does not coerce anybody, only invite everybody. But Michael, we, we looked in February at those 21 e Coptic Egyptian Christians who were, were yes. taken and... and I certainly didn't look at the uh, internet, but many people have done at the horrificness of I what know. happened to them. And we find it so hard to understand. It, it's yes. like they're trying to shock us more yes. and more every time they do something. They do. And, and I, I just want to be absolutely very, very fair here. Not all Muslims uh, like that. And many Muslims were just as horrified as we are. I'll give you an example, and I want to pay tribute to President Assisi of Egypt. Uh, that man is a devout Muslim, and yet he said, he said, I could not go to the cathedral and pay my condolences to the, Cop the head of the Coptic Church prior to revenging the blood of those 21 Christians. And he went over there and he bombed the, the uh, uh, ISIS uh, strongholds in Libya who caused that death. 
And so many Muslims in the media in Egypt and Lebanon and in many parts of the Arab world were horrified and they were, they were uh, condemning of that kind of uh, barbarism uh, as much as anybody else. So I, I want to be fair and, 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 and thank all the Muslims who uh, are really standing with the truth and, and, and standing for justice and who have rejected those Muslims uh, who actually they would kill them. I remember asking the man uh, who was involved in that movement that killed Anwar Sadat. Mm -hmm. I said, Anwar Sadat was a devout Muslim, he man who, a man who prayed, a man who actually got all the Muslim Brotherhood out of prison. <laughs> Why would you kill him? They said, because he's an apostate. He's not a good Muslim. He toasted Manahim Begin. He made peace with Israel. And therefore, he deserved death. And so they can turn on their fellow Muslims just as fast as they turn on Christians if they do not buy into their brand of Islam. Mm -hmm. And so just to, uh, if for the sake of fairness and for the sake of uh, intellectual honesty, uh, I needed to make that statement. But these extremists, they were the, I would call them fundamentalists, really, because uh, they are following the fundamentals of the faith. There are so many Muslim scholars now who are saying, now, wait a minute, we need to interpret the Quran from a modern-day perspective. We need to understand even there are passages in the Quran, and there's no denying of it like people do in the West ignorantly, and they say, it's not, it's not Islam. They say, yes, it's in our Quran. But the way they interpret the Quran is by saying, these things were relevant to the rise of Islam, to uh, their prophet Muhammad, that he needed to establish that. But now that the religion established, these commands are not obligatory on all Muslims, and they ought to stop. And so there is, in a sense, a war within Islam itself, within the within Muslim community. Mm -hmm. And we need to, be, uh, need to be aware of that. We need to express gratitude to those who are standing uh, with the Christians and supporting the Christians. Again, President Sisi, when the Muslim Brotherhood members burned churches, he insisted on fixing all those, those broken churches uh, at, the, at the expense of the state, that the military went in there and rebuilt so many of them, and some of them are just, just now actually coming back online, being completely refurbished and, and, and done by the military in Egypt. Okay. Uh, so I want, I want to pay tribute to President Sisi. That's good. And, and we also just want to talk a little bit about the Egyptian Coptics. You, you clearly sure. know them. You grew up within the church. I, I understand that at the point of, of death for some of those 21 uh, Coptic Christians, they declared their faith. And I've seen yeah. stories since of um, members of her family who've said, I'm willing to forgive. And even yes. if I met the, the, the killer, I, I, yeah. I would testify. Yes. Out of this, will the church come out stronger in Egypt, do you think, or uh, will it kowtow? There is no doubt in my mind that the church will grow stronger. I'll give you another example. When the Muslim Brotherhood kind of muscled their way, with the help of the American administration, into power in Egypt, and they were in government for 12 months, 12 miserable months, and they were miserable, not just to the, well, they were to the Christians, of course, above all, but they were miserable to the rest of the country. They brought the country to its knees economically. And then the Christians did what only Christians can do, and that's they began prayer meetings. There were prayer meetings all over Egypt. Some of them were going on 24-7, and people calling upon the Lord to help them. And as a direct result of God answering the cries of the believers, 33 million Egyptians, both Muslims and Christians, uh, mostly Muslims really, took to the streets, which forced the hand of the man who was at that time the head of the army, General Sisi, to say, I'm a steward of the people and I need to be on the side of the people. And he brought about all these wonderful changes that are happening and uh, uh, had, you know, of course, the, the Muslim, head of the Muslim Brotherhood is in prison. So God still responds to the prayers of his people. And this is something in the West we need to understand and we need to learn from our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. The love for their persecutors, which is in obedience to the command of Jesus. They're willing to forgive them, just as Jesus did on the cross, as we will celebrate tomorrow. 
hang on that cross, forgive them, Father. And all of that is, can only strengthen the church, not weaken it. Amen. Well, I want to come back and ask you about the Western church now, because yeah. in comparison, we, we are so weak. But let me just say thank you for emails and texts that are coming in. Alan, you've written and said, uh, Dear Gordon, could you please ask Dr. Yusuf, what is the current state of the Coptic Christians in Egypt? Well, maybe we've just already been answering that one. Yeah. And uh, this text from Osa, I hope that's the way to pronounce your name, Osa, says, please forgive my ignorance here. I heard the news about the Kenya killing hostage yeah. situation today. That's yeah. a tragic one. I don't know if you've heard news of that. I think there was yes. something about 70 who've been killed in yes. Kenya today. And uh, Osa, you say, I just want to know, is there really a difference between Al Shabbat, Boko Haram, IS, Al Qaeda, etc.? Also, my home country, Nigeria, has just elected a Muslim president. Should we be worried? Can we just deal with that one for a, sure. for a minute? Is uh, there a difference? Uh, no. Uh, and, and if it's a difference, it's very minimal. In fact, that's the one thing they have in common. This is the idea that we're going to go back to fundamental Islam of the 7th century Saudi desert. Uh, and they, they all share their hatred toward uh, non fundamentalist Muslims, whether it be secular Muslims or Christians. Mm -hmm. So, yes, no, there's no difference. And uh, Shabab went in, as I saw in the news, I have family in Kenya living there and ministering there, and it was tragic. And they aimed for the Christians. They made sure all the Muslim students left first, right. and then they went for the Christians, start killing them one by one. This is happening and continues to happen very sadly. As to Nigeria, I am not really sure. Unfortunately, we had, you know, a Christian in court uh, president who allowed Boko Haram to grow in, in, in leaps and bounds, and he was not taking firm stand. This new Muslim leader who was just elected, the first thing he said, he's going to basically end uh, Boko Haram. And so, uh, with, regardless uh, of who is in leadership, we need to be praying that God will give him the courage to keep that promise and to actually go after these terrorists, just as President Sisi in Egypt and Sabisi in Tunisia are doing. They are ridding their countries of terrorists as much as they can. And uh, so we need to be praying for them. The Bible tells us to pray for those in authority. Well, bless you. And of course, we've got an election coming up here in the United Kingdom, and, and we need to, to pray so much that yeah. uh, the person who's appointed to be our leader will, will be someone who will have the courage to stand up for their, their, their beliefs. But let, let's come back. We, we ended the, just before those, uh, looking at those texts and emails by saying that the Coptic Church right. is, is standing up and is being courageous yes. at this time. And yes. yet the response from the Western Church to our brothers yeah. and sisters who are struggling and suffering in so many ways is pathetic. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I have mean, just... Go on, go yes. <laughs> I've just written an article on this. And if your viewers would go to michaelyousef.com, just my name, michaelyousef.com, yep. you'll see that article just came out today. And I, I'm really drawing comparison between the Christians, I mean, true believers in Germany prior to the Nazis and how they were indifferent toward the persecution of the Jews in Germany. And then by the time the Nazis came after Catholics and Protestants, uh, it was too late. We in the West, as Christians, we really stood way, way, way so aloof from the suffering of the Christian church in Pakistan, in Indonesia, in the Middle East, in Africa, and thought, well, that could never come here. Now, the problem is, by the time it gets to us, it will be too late. Mm -hmm. And so I'm appealing, particularly to pastors, make it an issue of prayer on a regular basis uh, and, and to support and to stand with. There are many wonderful uh, ministries and organizations who are doing great work uh, among the persecuted. And get involved. Have your congregations involved and, and, and do something because if you don't stand with your suffering brothers and sisters, uh, when the day comes, we will stand alone too. Uh, and I'm not saying that this will happen or it's going to happen, but I'm saying that's our obligation. That's our call. It's our privilege 
to stand with those who are persecuted today. Because if we just become inward looking and navel gazing and, and it's our problems and our needs and our wants and who's going to what, you know, and, and we get so bogged down in our church politics that we lose vision of the church for whom Jesus loves, the bride of Christ that is going to be in heaven with him. These brothers and sisters are going to be with us. So I'm challenging all the believers who are watching right now and the pastors particularly, begin Share a vision, elevate a vision in the eyes of your congregation. Our church here from day one, we said we're going to take 20% of every money that we get and give it to missions. And we've done that for 28 years. And it's not only the money, but it's also uh, the prayers and, and the involvement in all these ministries and missions. And so I am appealing to all my brothers and sisters in Christ this is the time. This is the hour. Don't let it pass us by because we will regret it. Amen. And amen to your church for the way that you're standing up and, and the way that you're giving also to encourage mission. Thank you so much for that. Now, okay. th there was one country in the Middle East we haven't really talked about. Mm. Born, created in 1948, but the country yes. of, of Israel, uh, right. surrounded by the, the Muslims and particularly by IS. How, how yeah. do you see Israel at this time and where does it fit into what you believe God is saying as we come towards the end times? Well, I think uh, it's, it's clear that Israel is a major part of that end times plan. Uh, nobody can really deny that. Uh, and even those of us within the evangelical uh, uh, atmosphere who, uh, who disagree on the nuances, uh, there can be no doubt that uh, God has a plan for Israel. And as it is, there are many of them, of course, in the Messianic movement, uh, uh, wonderful uh, Jewish brothers in Christ, and uh, they're reaching out to their brothers and sisters in the Arab world, and they want to have those kind of relationships with them, because they know we're going to end up in heaven together. So Israel has a, pl a place in the plan of God. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the Antichrist is going to make a peace plan, uh, covenant with Israel for seven years, but then he's going to renege halfway through. Uh, so uh, he, he cannot, we cannot ignore Israel, and we cannot forget the fact that they are very vulnerable, and they are doing all they can. And I know many Christians in Israel who have, have freedom, of course, to operate like they've never had. Some of them came from other Arab countries. And, and they have a lot of freedom in Israel. Uh, so um, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we need to pray for Israel. That's what the Scriptures teach us, isn't it? Yeah, and absolutely. And uh, we're commanded to pray for only two cities in the Bible. One is the home city, the place we're in, and the other is, is for Jerusalem. And so that's right. Uh, that's right, and we believe certainly as a TV station it's important. We should be encouraging yeah. people to stand with Israel and to be supporting Israel at this time. John from Glasgow up in Scotland has written and said, um, always a great program. Two questions. Isaiah 19, verse 4, do you think that has happened in the past or still to come? And Isaiah 19, verses 18 to 25, when do you think this will take place? And... Um, Isaiah 19 is a proclamation against Egypt. Well, yes. I'm sure I don't yeah. need to tell you what yeah. Isaiah 19 is at all. <laughs> um, but, but of course, it, it, it comes towards the end there by saying yeah. in verse 24, in that day, Israel will be one of three with Egypt yes. and Assyria, a blessing yeah. in the land. So yeah. where, where do you think to, uh, that uh, Isaiah 19 is at this moment of time? Well, uh, you can take it in several ways that when the Christian faith was, for the first 600 years, uh, spread in Egypt, Syria, and uh, the land of Israel, uh, there was a natural relationship between all those churches for, for, for at least 500 years. Mm -hmm. But then if this is going to be something more political, that certainly is, is going to happen in the future. So whichever way you take it, it's, a, uh, it's, it's either happened or is Happening. I personally believe the book of Revelation has, is threefold, that it has happened at the time of John, is happening, and it will happen. Uh, okay. It's just like our salvation. We are saved, and we are being saved, and we will be saved eternally. 
the kingdom of God is here and yet to come. Uh, so I, I, I take that uh, principle of biblical interpretation. Uh, but as to when it's going to happen, I'm sorry, my brother, I, <laughs> I am not in the business of prediction. Even the Lord Jesus said, he said, nobody knows the hour, only uh, the Father in heaven, not even the Son. He voluntarily did not want to know the hour. So I'm not going to tread where angels feel to trod. <laughs> oh, well, bless you. Michael, it's been great to talk to you tonight. We've got about a couple of minutes left on the program or so. We're looking forward as we're doing this program live now to, well, tomorrow, of course, is, is what we call in the Good Friday, yes. the, the day when Christ died, and then two days later, R Resurrection Sunday. If I said to you, Amen. what would you say to the folks in the United Kingdom as they just look forward to those two days in the last couple of minutes of a program? What would you say? Well, this is the week that has changed the world beginning on uh, Palm Sunday when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And it's not just the fact that he entered into Jerusalem victoriously. This is a prophetic thing about him coming as victorious king of all kings and lord of all lords. Uh, it was a prophetic thing that happened on Palm Sunday. And then, of course, his death redeeming us because we could not be redeemed with the blood of uh, bulls and, and, and lambs. And therefore, the precious blood of the perfect, sinless Son of God who came from heaven, born of a virgin, died a pure and sinless, lived a pure and sinless life, died on the cross as a criminal. Then he rose again victoriously to assure everyone who will place their faith in him that they too will rise with him. They too will reign and rule with him in heaven. That is our hope. Without the resurrection, we have a dead religion, worshiping a dead hero. And that's what set the, sets the Christian faith apart, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power of that resurrection. It is a historic fact that attested to by hundreds of hundreds of eyewitnesses who saw the resurrected Jesus. So I pray that if you have not committed your life to Jesus Christ, if you have not come and asked for his forgiveness and eternal life from his hand, that you would do that today. And he will come and sup with you and invite you into his kingdom here and now, and your name be written in the book of life. So no matter what happens in the world, whatever events take place, you can be assured you're going to be in heaven with him. And I look forward to seeing you in heaven if I don't see you soon in England. Amen. Well, we are in England. Would you like to pray for us just before we come Absolutely. to the end of the program? Please do yes. that, Michael. Our precious Father, what a privilege and honor that you would call us out of darkness, that you will open our blind spiritual eyes to recognize that we are sinners and headed for hell, and that you eternally saved us through the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you sent from heaven to die on that cross. Father, we thank you for your graciousness. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And now we pray, Father God, those folks who are watching right now, many of them are suffering, many of them are going through tough circumstances, whatever and wherever they may be, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will reach down and minister to them, that bless them. And I pray for uh, Gordon. I pray for the, the, the entire Revelation uh, ministry. I pray that you will continue to give them your anointing, give them your favor, and lead them from one point of glory into another. For I pray that in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Michael, it's been a joy to talk to you. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule this week to spend time with us. I'm very much looking forward to Sunday afternoon for us here on Revelation TV and being able to, to listen to your leading the way and look forward week by week to having an appointment with you on Sunday. So bless you and thank, thank you, you so much thank for talking so with much, us. Thank you so much, my brother. Thank you so much for having and me. And I want to say thank you to you at home for having been with us for uh, t tonight. Uh, it's been a great program. I've made an appointment for 5.30 on Sundays. Hope you have too. And I'm going across now to the office and uh, helping on the phones. I hope that you're going to perhaps ring up and I'll have the opportunity of talking with you. It's important we understand the times in which we live. That's why we need programs like tonight and those on Sunday afternoon. So make an appointment. We look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for being with us tonight. God bless. Bye-bye. <laughs>